Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Lesson 1 is ready for teaching on October 1. It's titled Rebellion in a Perfect Universe and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new series of lessons which will give us hope and also provide us with doctrinal, biblical information that will help us understand more about not only what we are like, what you are like, and also about the salvation that comes to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. As we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that we will know more, but we will also walk more closely with you, and that each of us may have the opportunity of making that choice to follow Jesus. And today I'd like to pray for Kili in Nairobi in Kenya, for John and Lynn in Hawaii, and then for Claudio in Brazil. But there's a group of people from a number of different countries in the, in the Caribbean I'd like to pray for. Leon in Belize, Doreen in the Cayman Islands, Garth in Jamaica, Lindale in Antigua and Barbuda, Jocelyn in Barbados, Ormita in St Lucia, Marvin in Trinidad and Tobago, and Monica in St Vincent and the Grenadines. And Lord, wherever people are listening, whether it be in the major continents of North America or South America or Africa or Australia or Europe, Lord, we just thank you that we can have your word, not only just to read, but to have it become part of our lives. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. Let's read that again, Isaiah 14 verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. Many thinkers have tried to explain the origin of evil. Some suggest that evil always has existed because, in their view, good can be appreciated only in contrast to evil. Others believe that the world was created perfect, but somehow evil emerged. For example, in Greek mythology, evil started when the curious Pandora opened a sealed box out of which flew all the evils of the world. This myth, however, does not explain the origin of the evils supposedly hidden in the box. By contrast, the Bible teaches that our loving God is all-powerful and perfect, as we read in First Chronicles 29, verses 10 and 11. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. And Matthew 5 verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. All that he does must likewise be perfect, which includes how he created our world. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. He created our world. How then could sin and evil appear in a perfect world? According to Genesis 3, the fall of Adam and Eve brought sin, evil and death here. But 
That answer raises another issue. Even before the fall, evil already had existed, manifested by the serpent who deceived Eve, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Hence, we need to go back, even before the fall, in order to find the source and origins of the evil that so dominates our present existence and that at times can make it pretty miserable. Sunday, September 25, Creation and Expression of Love Nature in its present condition carries an ambiguous message that mingles both good and evil. Rose bushes can produce lovely and fragrant roses, but also harmful and painful thorns. A toucan can impress us with its beauty and then dismay us by assaulting the nests of other birds and eating their frail chicks. Even human beings who are capable of kindness one moment can be vicious, hateful and even violent in the next. No wonder that in the parable of the wheat and the tares, the servants ask the field owner, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Matthew thirteen twenty seven. And the owner replied, An enemy has done this. In verse 28, likewise, God created the universe perfect, but an enemy defiled it with the mysterious seeds of sin. Read 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16. What can the certainty that God is love tell us about the nature of his creative activities? 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. The fact that God is love in 1 John 4 verses 8 and 16 conveys at least three basic implications. First, love by its very nature cannot exist closed in itself, but must be expressed. What kind of love is not expressed? God's love is shared internally among the three persons of the Godhead and externally in his relationship with all his creatures. Second, all that God does is an expression of his unconditional and unchangeable love. This includes his creative works, his redemptive actions and even the manifestations of his punitive judgments. Actually, God's love, we read in The Desire of Ages, page 762, has been expressed in his justice no less than in his mercy. Justice is the foundation of his throne and the fruit of his love. And third, since God is love, and all that he does expresses his love, he cannot be the originator of sin, which is in direct opposition to his own character. But... Did God really need to create the universe? From the perspective of his sovereignty, one could say no, because it was a decision of his free will. But from the perspective of his loving nature, he wanted a universe as a means of expressing his love. And how amazing that he created some forms of life, such as humans, not only to be capable of responding to his love, but also of sharing and expressing love, not just to him, but to others as well.
And we'll also look at Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so to finish today, look around at the created world. In what ways can you see in it reflections of God's love, despite the ravages of sin? How can we learn to draw lessons of hope from the expression of God's love revealed in creation? Monday, September 26. Free will, the basis for love. Read 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. What does this passage tell us about free will as a condition to cultivating love? 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Artificial flowers can be gorgeous, but they do not grow and bloom as do real ones. Robots are pre-programmed to talk and to perform many tasks, but they have neither life nor emotions. In reality, life and free will are indispensable conditions for someone to receive, cultivate and share love. So our loving God created angels, including Lucifer, and human beings with freedom to make their own choices, including the possibility of following a wrong path. In other words, God created the whole universe as a perfect and harmonious environment for his creatures to grow in love and in wisdom. In 1 John 4, 7-16, the Apostle John underscores that God is love and that he manifested his love to us by sending his own Son to die for our sins. As a result, we should express our gratitude for his infinite love by loving one another. Such love, divinely originated, would be the most convincing evidence that God abides in us and that we abide in him. This appeal to reflect God's love to one another makes sense only if addressed to creatures who can choose to cultivate and express that love, in contrast to live a self-centred life. However, freedom of choice can easily be misused, a sad fact demonstrated in the tragic rebellion of Lucifer in heaven. Even recognising the importance of free will, some people still wonder, if God knew that Lucifer would rebel, why did God create him? Does the creation of Lucifer not make God ultimately responsible for the origin of sin? That can be a very difficult question to speculate about because it depends upon many factors, including what exactly is meant by the word responsible. 
The origin and nature of sin are mysteries that no one can fully explain. Even so, God did not ordain sin to exist. He only allowed its existence, and then at the cross, he took upon himself the ultimate punishment for that sin, thus enabling him ultimately to eradicate it. In all our painful musings about evil, we must never forget that God himself paid the highest price for the existence of sin and evil, and that he has suffered from them more than any of us ever will. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 and verses 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy, but I say to you, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Romans 5 verses 6 to 11, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And so to finish today, free will, a gift from God, is sacred, but comes heavy laden with powerful consequences, not only for yourself, but also for others as well. What important decisions are you, using this gift, about to make, and what will be the consequences of whatever choices you make? Tuesday, September 27, Mysterious Ingratitude. Read Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 to 19. What can we learn from this passage about the mysterious origin of sin? Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the mountain, the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God." And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendour. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings, that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. 
Therefore I brought fire from your midst, it devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth, in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you, you have become a horror, and shall be no more for ever. Much of the book of Ezekiel was written in end-time symbolic language. In many instances, specific entities such as persons, animals and objects and local events are used to represent and describe broader cosmic and or historical realities. In Ezekiel 28, 1-10, the Lord spoke of the king of Tyre. Tyre itself was a prosperous ancient Phoenician port city as a rich and proud ruler who was only a man but who claimed to be a god and who sat, he claimed, in the throne of the gods. Let's read Ezekiel 28, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am God, I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man, and not a god. Though you set your heart as the heart of a god, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding you have gained riches for yourself, and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a god, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendour. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a god? But you shall be a man, and not a god, in the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. Then in Ezekiel 28, 12-19, this historical reality becomes an analogy to describe the original fall of Lucifer in the heavenly courts. So, the king of Tyre, who was a human being living in the midst of the seas, as we read in verses 2 and 8, now represents the anointed cherub who covers, in verse 14, living in Eden, the garden of God, in verse 13, and upon the holy mountain of God, in verse 14. A crucial statement in the whole account is found in Ezekiel 28.15, which says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Hence, Lucifer's perfection included the potential for evil, the potential to do wrong, and that was because as a moral being, Lucifer possessed free will, part of what it means to be a perfect being. In reality, Lucifer was created perfect, which included his ability to choose freely. However, abusing that perfection by the misuse of his free will, he became corrupted by considering himself more important than he actually was. No longer satisfied with how God had created and honoured him, Lucifer lost his thankfulness to God and wished to receive more recognition than he actually deserved. How this could happen with a perfect angelic being living in a perfect universe is, as already mentioned, a mystery. Ellen White writes in The Truth About Angels, page 30, Sin is a mysterious, unexplainable thing. There is no reason for its existence. To seek to explain it is to seek to give a reason for it, and that would be to justify it. Sin appeared in a perfect universe, a thing that was shown to be inexclusible. And so to finish today, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul says that in everything we should give thanks. 
And that full verse reads, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How can these words help us to overcome any feelings of ingratitude and self-pity, especially in trying times? Wednesday, September 28. The Price of Pride Within Scripture we can see two predominant themes or motifs that are competing with each other. One is the theme of Salem, Mount Zion, Jerusalem and the New Jerusalem, which represents God's kingdom. The other is the theme of Babel and Babylon, which stands for Satan's counterfeit domain. Several times God called his people out of pagan Babylon to serve him in the promised land. For example, Abram, later Abraham, was asked to move from Ur of the Chaldees to the land of Canaan. We read that story in Genesis 11.31 to chapter 12 verse 9. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and... The Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Then he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. At the end of their long exile, the Jews left Babylon and returned to Jerusalem, as the story goes in Ezra chapter 2. We'll just read verse 1, which says, Now these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, every one to his whole city. And the rest of the chapter, which goes to 70 verses, just lists the heads of families and the number of people who went with each family. And in the book of Revelation, God's people are called out of end-time Babylon, as you read in Revelation 18 verse 4, to abide with him eventually on Mount Zion and the New Jerusalem, which we read about in Revelation 14, 1 and Revelation 21, 1 to 3 and verse 10. Let's read those verses. Revelation 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. And Revelation 14 and verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And Revelation 21 verses 1 to 3, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. 
Then I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be their God. And verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Read Isaiah chapter 12, verses 12 to 15. What far-reaching consequences did Lucifer's pride, while in heaven, bring to the universe and to this world? Revelation 14, beginning at verse 12. How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit." In the Bible, the city of Babylon stands for a power in direct opposition to God and his kingdom. And the king of Babylon, with special allusion to Nebuchadnezzar, becomes a symbol of pride and arrogance. God had revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar that Babylon was only the gold head of the great image of successive empires that uh, we read about in Daniel 2, 37 and 38. And Daniel chapter 2, verses 37 and 38 read, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Challenging God's revelation, the king made an image entirely of gold, a symbol that his kingdom would last forever, and even required everyone to worship it, as we read in Daniel chapter 3. And you'll remember that Daniel and his friends were cast into the fire of that pit, and that God protected them, as in the case of the king of Tyre in Ezekiel twenty-eight twelve to 19 the king of Babylon also became a symbol of Lucifer, as we read in Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19 Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst, it devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror, and shall be no more for ever. Isaiah 14 verses 3 to 11 describes the fall of the haughty and oppressive king of Babylon. Isaiah chapter 14 beginning at verse 3. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow, and from your fear in the hard bondage in which you were made to serve, that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, How the oppressor has ceased! 
The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked. The scepter of the rulers. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He who ruled the nations in anger. Is persecuted and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed the cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. Hell from beneath is excited about you, to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations, they all shall speak and say to you, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to shoal, and the sound of your stringed instruments. The maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. Then, Isaiah fourteen twelve to 15 moves from the historical realm to the heavenly courts and highlights that a similar proud and arrogant spirit generated the original fall of Lucifer. The text explains that Lucifer planned to exalt his throne above all heavenly hosts and make himself like the Most High in verse 14 of Isaiah 14. This was the beginning of a new and hostile situation in, in which God's altruistic love and cooperation would be challenged by Lucifer's selfishness and competition. The enemy was not afraid of accusing God of what he himself was, and of spreading his lies to other angels. Here are the mysterious origins of evil in the universe. And so to finish today, why is it so easy to become proud and boastful of either our positions or achievements, or both? How does keeping the cross before us prevent us from falling into such a trap? Thursday, September 29. The Spread of Unbelief Read Revelation chapter 12. What does this chapter teach about the spread of the rebellion in heaven to the earth? Revelation 12, beginning at verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea! For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. 
But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The fall of Lucifer was not a simple clash of conflicting ideas. Revelation 12 tells us that a major war broke out in heaven between Lucifer and his angels on one side, and Christ and his angels on the other. In this passage, Lucifer is called the great dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan, and the accuser of the brethren in verses 9 and 10. Christ is referred to as Michael in verse 7, which means, who is like God. Based on the allusion to Michael the archangel of Jude verse 9, some interpreters believe that he is only an angelic being. Let's read Jude verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But in the book of Daniel, each major vision culminates with Christ and his eternal kingdom as the stone cut out without hands... Daniel chapter 2 verses 34 and 45. Have you watched while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces? And verse 45. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. As the Son of Man, in Daniel 9.13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. As the Prince of the Host, and the Prince of Princes, in Daniel 8.11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And in Daniel 8, verse 25, Through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart, he shall destroy many in their prosperity, he shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And as Michael, the great prince in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. So, as the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself, in Exodus 3, 1-6, and Acts 7, 30-33, etc., Michael must be the same divine person, that is, Christ himself. Let's read Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see the great sight, why the bush does not burn. So, when the Lord saw that the, he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. 
Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And Acts 7, beginning at verse 30, And when forty years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marvelled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Revelation 12 provided a general overview of this ongoing controversy, which, one, began in heaven with the rebellion of Lucifer and one-third of the heavenly angels, two, culminated with Christ's decisive victory at the cross, and three, still continues against God's end-time remnant people. Reflecting on the beginning of this controversy, Ellen G. White explains that God, in his great mercy, bore long with Lucifer. He was not immediately degraded from his exalted station when he first indulged the spirit of discontent, nor even when he began to present his false claims before the loyal angels. Long was he retained in heaven. Again and again he was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. That's from The Great Controversy, pages 495 and 496. We do not know how long that war lasted in the heavenly realms. Regardless of its intensity and time span, the most important aspect of the whole struggle was that Satan and his angels were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Revelation 12, verse 8. And we also look at Luke chapter 10, and verse 18. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The problem, of course, was that they came here to the earth. And so to finish the day, what are ways in which we can see the reality of this battle being played out on the earth? What is our only hope to overcome our enemy in this battle? Friday, September 30. From the book Confrontation by Ellen G. White, page 21, we read, There was no possible hope for the redemption of those, Satan and his angels, who had witnessed and enjoyed the inexpressible glory of heaven and had seen the terrible majesty of God and, in presence of all this glory, had rebelled against him. There was no new and wonderful exhibitions of God's exalted power that could impress them so deeply as those they had already experienced. If they could rebel in the very presence of glory inexpressible, they could not be placed in a more favourable condition to be proved. There was no reserve force of power, nor was there any greater heights and depths of infinite glory to overpower their jealous doubts and rebellious murmurings. Their guilt and their punishment must be in proportion to their exalted privileges in the heavenly court. End of quote. And then from the Desire of Ages, page 22. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he covenanted to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, as we read in John 3.16. End of quote. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. 1. In class, wrestle with the question of whether God is ultimately responsible for the origin and existence of evil in our world. How might we seek to answer that charge? 
Two, how does the cross fit in with our understanding of the whole question of evil? Why must the cross and what happened there be central to any understanding of the origin of evil? Three, after so many millennia of sin and suffering in our world, Satan should now be fully aware of the tragic consequences of his rebellion. Why, then, does he still carry on his rebellion against God? For, in Matthew chapter 5, 43-48, Christ speaks of God's unconditional love for all human beings as the pattern for all our own interactions. How can you reflect this pattern more closely within your family and church? Let's read Matthew 5, beginning at verse 43. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And five, the Apostle Peter warns us that the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Read also Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. How can we prevail against the wiles of the devil, as expressed in verse 11? Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and, having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Set Free From Chains by Andrew McChesney Screams pierce the air in the rural village in Laos. A Seventh-day Adventist pastor who was visiting the village with a small team of church workers headed toward the loud cries to find out what was happening. He was surprised to see a 16-year-old boy chained to the wooden floor of his family home. What happened to your boy? he asked the parents. Why is he chained up? The parents looked sad. Our son Eyre has been sick for many years, his father said. He becomes normal for several hours, but then he loses his mind again, several times a day, his mother said. The parents had spent all their money trying to find a cure, but the situation steadily had gotten worse until they reluctantly decided to leave Eyre in chains all the time to prevent him from harming himself and others. He had been bound to the wooden floor for the past six months. The pastor spoke with Eyre and told him and his parents about the saving love of Jesus. If Jesus is willing, he can heal Eyre, he said. He asked for permission to pray for the boy. Eyre's parents happily agreed. Hope shone in their faces that their son would be healed. 
A few days later, the pastor and his team again visited Eyre and prayed for him. The pastor invited the family to worship in the nearest Adventist church in a neighbouring village. The next Sabbath, the parents arrived at church with Eyre, his hands bound in chains. Each church member prayed for Eyre, and then the pastor also asked the boy's father to pray for him. All heads bowed as the father prayed to Jesus on behalf of his son. From that day, the boy was healed. He returned to normal and no longer needed to be chained up. Neighbours were amazed, and they deluged Eyre's parents with questions. Is this the boy who was ill for many years and was chained up? One asked. Why is he okay now? Asked another. Who healed him? The parents explained that the Christian God had healed their boy. Not only did Eyre's parents accept Jesus as their personal saviour after the healing, but many other families did so as well. Those families are among 122 people who were baptised at the church in April 2021 filling the church building to overflowing. We praise God for performing so many miracles in this area, resulting in so many people coming to be saved, said the Leo pastor who shared this story with Adventist Mission. Thank you for your Sabbath School Mission offerings that support the spread of the gospel in Laos and around the world. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.